Today is Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. We are at Washington City Hall in the City Council Chambers for our workshop meeting. Our meetings are streamed live and can be accessed later at washingtoncity.org slash meetings. Council, this time I'm gonna to turn to you for an approval of the agenda as outlined. So moved, Mayor. Motion by Councilman Coates. Second. Second by Councilman Belliston. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The workshop agenda is approved. Our first item of business is our VACA report. VACA stands, well, I'll let Shelly, uh, Candelaria, our victims of crime, uh, our, our victims advocate, explain what VACA is and why she needs to present to the council annually. Welcome, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you. So VOCA, it stands for the Victim of Crime Act. And um, so it's a fund of money that helps so that it grants money to advocates in various positions to help so that they can do their job to the best of their abilities. Um, so part of the requirement is that I present to you guys and let you know what I'm doing and all of that good stuff. So I'm the victim advocate for the police department, Washington City Police Department. I have been since October of 2022 and um, I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's a great department to work with. And so as a victim advocate, my role is to help people access services that fit their needs. So, so generally speaking, I would help people that have been a victim of a crime or people that just need services. And, um, but this includes people ha helping people get mental health treatment, um, substance abuse treatment, housing, helping them point you know, find any other various services that they need. So in 2023, I assisted 88 people of Washington City that had been victims of domestic violence. As of today, I have helped 34 people. So this rate is slightly more than a 50% increase um, on an annualized basis. A large portion of that is helping them access protective orders so that um, they have better protection. And I also go to court with them and without offering any kind of legal advice, I can explain to them like what's happening in the court, what each hearing means, things like that. Um, I'm always amazed at the strength of the clients that I work with when they're going through what they're going through. So another order of protection that has become happening more often is stalking injunctions. And so last year, or in 2023, I helped 56 victims. And so far this year, I've helped 17, which is a 21% increase. So, and all of these are within Washington City. And um, I've also helped um, clients that, where their victimization happened in Washington City, but they have now moved out of state. So I've helped them access mental health treatment. I've helped that as far as Vermont. So I'm trying to hit as many places as I can. Um, and then I have assisted clients um, to, I've assisted them to relocate, to get away from their abuser, but also to start a new life and help set up services where they relocate to. Uh, I even assisted in getting a dog listed as a protected person on a protective order, which, I was really proud of, um, and it's because the owner had been victimized by someone that was trying to steal that dog. So oh. they were both listed as protected people. In the past year, I have served over 200 people total, and I have, in that same time frame, I have provided services, um, provided over 1,400 services as far as helping people access them. So funding is very, from VOCA is very specific as to what I am allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. So they have allowable costs and unallowable costs. Um, helping a parent that witnessed their child die by suicide, access mental health treatment, 
helping family find grief support when their loved one died of an overdose and helping a person access mental health treatment because our officers were called to their home after they attempted suicide all fall under unallowable costs because technically they are not a victim of a crime. Um, I've also helped a lonely Vietnam vet access group and social support uh, when the VA was unable to meet his needs and that's also considered an unallowable cost. So it gets pretty difficult sometimes to do my job and be able to do it as broad as I would like to do, but um, it also does a lot of good. Boca does a lot of good as well. So it's no secret that we have the best police department. I've worked with many police departments, and this one is by far the best. Are you, are you just saying that because Chief Williams snuck into the thing? Well, I didn't know he was here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but our we agree, by the way, but you know. <laughs> That's correct. It is a correct way of thinking. Um, our officers do go above and beyond, and um, they really care about the citizens of Washington City. And so as a civilian employee of Washington City Police Department, I would like the ability to go above and beyond eventually as well. Um, I hope to someday broaden victim services to more of community services with victims being the priority. And so I feel like a police department should be a place where people can come to access services even though there isn't a crime. Um, it should just be a safe place that they know that they can get the help that they need. And so I hope to someday get to where I can help anyone regardless of if they're allowable or non-allowable cost. That's it. What a, what a thank you for all that you do and for caring for, for people in very difficult situations. We, we appreciate all of your work. Um, council comments, you know, questions, interaction with, with Shelly, our victim's advocate. You know, I just mentioned that, you know, VOC has been around since the early 80s. It's mm -hmm. a federal funding program for the state and local, so that's where the money comes from. If any of our citizens are wondering about that. But just wanted to say how much I appreciate what you do. You know, Dove's a great partner. And, uh, and, you know, we, we have a great alliance there with them. And mm -hmm. I just, I'm privy to this information, but uh, we actually had to turn away over 40 people this last year at Dove that came seeking services. And so we see that increase as well. Yeah. So um, we appreciate that, that we've got good work. Maybe when people are victims of crimes, they need all the help they can get, so. They do. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Just a question, maybe this is a dumb question. Who is it that makes the determination if so something is allowable or not? Is that part of the federal rules or? So I'm not entirely sure on that. I just, so we, I have a grant manager. The, this whole area has the same grant manager and um, she makes sure that everything is falling where it needs to be, so. Okay, I was just curious, those those situations that you, you know, mentioned that you said were unallowable or whatever, boy, those are much needed yeah. services to those people that are struggling and hurting and, and um, anyway, so you really are. thank you for what you do. So. You're welcome. I enjoy it. I enjoy my job. <laughs> Count, Councilman, I might make a comment that ties a little bit and, and Chief Williams can stop me if I say something he doesn't like, but you know, whenever we have a grant, the grants are wonderful, but they come with restrictions on things that they will pay for and won't pay for. And sometimes, sometimes a grant is a really good opportunity to get us off the ground and get us uh, the services that we need to start with. But then often they become so restrictive and, and, and the grant funds start to start to squeeze down as our needs expand, right? And so we always know that with a grant, Typically, we kind of have to come in on the back end and supplement, and then at some point, maybe the the, th the needs that we want to provide don't aren't covered by that grant anymore. So we've been looking at that. I've talked with Chief Williams a few times because um, we are seeing the same thing that you're seeing is that that maybe the grant is a great thing to get us going, but may not be the long term solution for our city. Shelly, you did a fantastic job. Thank you for helping us understand more clearly what you do 
And more importantly, thank you for the difference that you make in the lives of those in our community or who have been victims in our community. We appreciate you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Next on the agenda is, drum roll please, uh, Cotton Days Preview. <laughs> uh, welcome uh, the, the Cotton Days Committee Chair, uh, Sherry Staley-Tate. Take it away, Sherry. I had to bring berries because we're very, very excited about Cotton Days. And yes, it was berry day at the farm and they are delicious. So there should be enough for y'all to take a pint home. Will you, would you hand those? So um, Cotton Days coming up here in about, gosh, three weeks. And uh, we're ready to kick it off. We're excited. We've been working hard. Um, so our Grand Marshal this year, Grand Marshals, I should say, are... Um, Carol and Meryl Leaf Clove, so Mayor Clove. And we were very excited and appreciate Mayor Staley for taking the lead on that and inviting them, inviting them to come. And so the Chamber of Commerce are going to be kind of their escorts and we've got a golf cart and we're gonna make sure they're to all the places and, and make sure they feel really grand as they should because they've done grand things for our community. Um, as usual, we're going to do our field trips, our second grade field trips. Um, about 2,500 students will come. That will start on Tuesday the 23rd. And um, Rosie Kirkland, John and Rosie, take the lead on that along with, um, I was on the phone with good old Dean Terry for a few hours <laughs> last night, having a conversation of 21 years of him coming and bringing his, um, you know, stagecoach and all the historical things that, you know, really uh, represent our founding of Washington City. And he, he's going to be 90 this next week. And he's as excited as when I asked him 20 years ago to do it. <laughs> and so we're, we really appreciate the Terry family and everything that they do. Um, Thursday night also will be the kickoff concert that we started. This will be our third year of a concert. And we have um, Cole Hartley coming, and it's going to be fun. If you haven't been to the concert in the park, we hope you'll come and bring your lawn chair. The food trucks will be there. It's just a fun, fun atmosphere, and it's growing every year. And Jordan he has he's our, our friend that goes and tells all our neighbors that we're having a concert. He's built those relationships, and we appreciate him for doing that. And the really exciting thing is the unveiling on Friday night of the um, Eric Dowdle, Doodle, however you say it. If you talk to Carmen, it's different than I say it. But <laughs> the unveiling of that awesome puzzle. And um, I've seen snippets of it. I haven't seen the whole thing. But I can tell you that it's a very exciting thing. And one thing that has been really fun is, you know, I hang out with Carmen a lot. Her phone rings nonstop for people wanting that um, puzzle to purchase and and so the youth council i believe are selling those um, one thing to go along with the puzzle is in the elementary schools they have a, a art contest going on and you know the the theme is uh, what is cotton days so it's going to be really fun and then they'll win a prize a puzzle and, and so that's exciting um, and you guys can go down through things. I just wanted to hit the, you know, those main things on Saturday. Of course, we have the, um, I'm gonna say, is it a 5K test? Okay, 5K, the run, and then the Lions Club, who we can't do an event without the Washington City Lions Club there, and the Historical Society. I'm not gonna read all of this to you. The mayor's there to do his historical walk, so some of you that can't do the 5K, be sure to walk with the mayor on that. But um, I just wanna, before I end, just really give a shout out to Michelle and Tess from the Community Center. Um, you know, we've, I was trying to think how long, I think Uncle George pulled me into this when I was a senior in high school and I just had my 40 year class reunion. So to tell you how long I've been involved with Cotton Days, and I don't know if it was even called that then, but um, we kind of just had a group of people that did it. And now to have the city support behind it is just magic. Like we, Rosie and I were just saying, it's like, just feels so good. And without Tess and Michelle, like carrying that heavy load, it, it, it wouldn't get done. I can tell you that because volunteers are different nowadays and back in the day. 
um, the parks department, and the public works, power, police and fire, everybody comes to that table, even the mayors there. And, um, you know, it's just people who love our community and that energy that's there and that we want to bring to the community. And, and my goal is I hope that we can outreach to some of these that don't know what community they belong to in the fields and Green Springs area, you know, um, but that sense of community, that sense of belonging somewhere. And, you know, it feels different here in Washington City. It really does. And, and our event is small compared to some, but it's grand. It's not commercial. It's not, it's, it's all the feel good stuff. And that's what matters. That's what makes it what it is. And so we're excited um, to, to do cotton days and to keep it going. And we hope you'll bring your families. And if you are at one of the events, we hope that you'll come up and like, especially the field trips and stuff. Like, I think it's important for the students to see who, you know, this is a city councilman, this is the mayor. I mean, it's, it's important and you guys play an important role and you play an important role with meeting the citizens that, that are in our community. So be present, empty a garbage can, whatever you need to do. But um, it takes all of us and I, and I think it's just a, a grand time. So I hope you'll take some berries because they are very, very good. And anyway, any questions? Are you excited? I'm excited. For okay. It. okay. I don't good. know about the rest of them, but I, I love cotton days. And I'm, I'm excited for the parade. I always love parades. So. Yes. Yes. But no, this will be fun. I, I was going to stop you, but you kept rolling. But uh, so I heard you say the mayor couldn't handle a 5K. Uh, is that what I heard? Well, I asked him. So, yeah, yeah. so as yeah. long as you, that I'm clear. And, yeah, and the, we're and clear on that. that so you can handle. run and he can walk. There we go. That would yes. be great. Yes. We're not going to run the historical walk. We're going to we're going to walk. We might power walk because he has to be back to judge that parade. So, you know, anyway, any other questions? Just appreciate all your time and effort that you put in. It's a lot of work. It, it's fun, though, and we love it. So thank you, though. Um, I was going to say, make sure that if you you if you can't get to all the things, try to get to some of the things. And and if you see somebody like John and Rosie or Carmen or somebody Make sure you let them know because honestly, it, it is a lot of work. But again, we used to carry a really heavier load, and now it's like we have these beautiful gals in the back that just are like, What do you need? And we're like, Okay, we can do this. You know, we're not getting any younger, but we think we're still young. So, anyway. Thank well, you guys. Well, Sherry, you're wonderful at deflecting the, the credit and spreading that out. But the reality is you're, you're doing a great job with Thank that you. committee and, you know, watching um, the interaction in, the, in that committee. Everybody kind of seems to know their marching orders. And as we approach it, we're just kind of fine tuning things. So I'm confident this will be be, be the great. best year yet. So thank you. We're, yes. I, we're all excited about it. we're going to be there. In fact, I just have to share a little bit. There was a reporter from the Deseret News that came down a few weeks ago. He was just blown away that we celebrate Cotton Days. And when I kind of explained to him what we do, he just couldn't believe it. I mean, there is certainly, um, this is a, a fun tradition of a very proud heritage that, that we need to keep alive. So thank you for your work to do it. It matters. It makes a difference. It, it does matter. It was, it was a great story too, by the way. And, and kind of the running joke is if you step off the committee, you have to have a replacement. So <laughs> we all just keep going. Anyway, thanks, you guys. Thank you. All right. Lester, are you ready to follow up that presentation with your uh, sewer master plan? I, I see that, that you're here to present on that to the council. And uh, we recognize Aaron Anderson with Bell and Collins and, and Bud Smitherman also here, the supervisor or manager with the sewer department. Appreciate you both being here to support Lester. And, and uh, as I understand, Lester, you're, you're, uh, you're getting out in front of this and this is kind of the first, uh, first step with the council here, right? That's correct. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council. Um, just kind of do a brief introduction. Uh, we've we've contracted with Bowen and Collins to do our uh, wastewater uh, master planning efforts. Uh, see if we can get our capital facilities plan ahead of the curve um, where we need to be with it. And if I can move this. Full screen for me. 
get this up and uh, kind of turn some. And Sherry, thanks for the strawberries, by the way. They'll, they look really good. Okay, all right. We might even send some home with Lester if he does a good job on this. I got it. Finally, maybe. There we go. Um, so, yeah, just a quick introduction for, for Aaron Anderson with Bowen Collins. Uh, wanted to bring the council up to speed kind of really early on with this. Um, we've gone down the road, we've made some preliminary planning assumptions, kind of identified our growth areas, um, established our, our base flow analysis, them kind of components, and kind of want to bring you guys up to speed a little bit, um, fill you out a little bit, and kind of get an understanding if, if, if we're off the mark in any way, shape, or form, feel free to let us know. We're still very early on and just want to get you guys in the equation early and, and make sure that any, any questions that you may have that we're able to get them addressed as part of the, the ongoing analysis as we dive into this deeper and, and really start getting into the nuts and bolts and what do we need to have in place to accommodate our growth. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Aaron and he'll have lots of information for you. Thanks, Lester. Welcome, Aaron. Good to be here with you this uh, afternoon slash evening, right in between there. Uh, as Lester said, my name is Aaron Anderson. I work with Bowen Collins and Associates and working with uh, Blake and Lester and Bud on this master plan update. I know that sewer is not the most glamorous of utilities that you provide as a city, but it's, uh, it's an important one, right? Everyone wants their, uh, their toilets to flush and their, their showers to flow away from the house. So. Our job is to make sure that there's infrastructure in place to, to make sure that happens and to accommodate growth. So with that, uh, as Lester said, now spill forward here, Lester, to advance. I don't know what I've done here. What have I done? There we go. Space bar. Okay, so like Lester said, we're, we, uh, master planning consists of kind of building your, found, your fundamental assumptions and then kind of establishing your evaluation criteria first off. And that consists of looking at historical flows and establishing really what is your demand per ERU, that, that acronym ERU standing for equivalent residential unit, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, essentially setting the groundwork for what the future plan will, will consist of. And so we're, this is what we're presenting on today is really this kind of groundwork and fundamental assumptions and some of these, these baseline assumptions that will be built into the plan. So we'll talk about historical sewer flow data. Uh, we'll talk about how we determined our demands per ERU. Sorry. We'll talk about our forecast for future growth and then our estimated probable distribution of growth. So. Again, wanted to present this to you early on, so if you have comments or feedback, we can get that incorporated before we're too far down the road. So the first step in determining essentially where you're going to go is to figure out where you've been and how much sewer flow you produce as a city right now. So in that, we looked at three years of historical water use data. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to directly meter how much wastewater comes out of a home. It goes through a lateral, but you can estimate how much water is being used indoor and the majority of that water being used inside is going to end up in the toilet or in the shower and the sink and it's going to end up in the wastewater collection system. So when you look at water use in the winter months when irrigation is you know non-existent or very low it can provide you with a good indication of how much water that that home produces uh, from a wastewater standpoint if that makes sense. So we reviewed a lot of data provided by the public works department uh, historical culinary water use records and also kudos to the city, uh, Washington City, you have a lot of sewer metering data that is not, I won't say is not typical for most municipalities, but a lot of points throughout the system that we can use to calibrate and, and measure flows in the system that, that is uh, commendable that you have that information. So that made our, uh, our planning evaluation even more, more accurate from that standpoint. We can look at actual flows in the sewer and correlate that indoor water use with the actual flows and make sure that we're pretty tight on our assumptions, if that makes sense. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between uh, what we're calling domestic flow and infiltration. Uh, all sewer collection systems, no matter how well you build them, are going to get some groundwater into them, especially in areas like the fields where you have relatively shallow groundwater. You're going to get groundwater in those pipes, and that's, that constitutes part of that overall flow. 
and we need to account for that as we're looking at sewer collection system capacity. So we'll look at the, both domestic and infiltration. And then the main takeaway here is that in the previous planning efforts that the city under, underwent, uh, the state standard values were utilized. So in the absence of data, you can use values that are established by the state as kind of standard values that represent uh, flows on a per capita basis. In this master plan update, we've looked at the actual historical data. And so we're not, we're gonna be uh, utilizing the actual data to determine these flows rather than using state standardized values. So it's more of a, a system specific approach, if that makes sense. So let's talk about the demand per ERU. Again, I mentioned ERU stands for equivalent residential unit. And the purpose of using the ERU is it helps us to normalize uh, various different types of connections to one consistent unit of measurement. And so in your city, you're gonna have predominantly residential development, but you also have commercial, uh, commercial, industrial, institutional schools, churches, things like that. What the ERU does is compare the water use of a typical single family home to those non-residential users, and then it converts all of your non-residential use into an equivalent number of homes. So we can just say, hey, the system has so many ERUs or so many equivalent homes is one way to think about it. So we just normalize all that demand to one unit. As we looked at your historical data and your connections, we calculated that in your system right now, you've got just over 17,000 ERUs in the system. And again, that consists of residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional connections. Um, as we look through your water use data, just to make a comment, we, we did exclude any dedicated ag meters and dedicated landscape meters because those meters obviously don't contribute to wastewater flow. They're just for irrigation purposes. Through that analysis, we determined that our estimated domestic flow, or we call in kind of our intentional wastewater that we would expect to be in the system, is 188 gallons per day per ERU. And then based on using that great data you have, measuring those flows throughout the system, we were able to calculate an estimated 36 gallons per day on average contributed per ERU in the system via infiltration. Obviously that infiltration occurs more in some areas than others, but that's essentially taking it and normalizing it across the system to say on average per ERU, every home you connect contributes 36 gallons per day of effective infiltration. So that comes as you, spend, as you extend your uh, sewer collection network out into more areas, you obviously increase the potential for gathering groundwater and, and infiltration water. That May I ask just a curiosity sure. question? What are the points in the system where the infiltration takes place? Like, is it? So what you'll see sometimes is it can, your pipe has joints, right? And no matter how well you, you insert those joints, you can get leaks through the joints. A lot of times you'll see it in manholes as well. So manholes, when they're constructed, you have a concrete, you know, precast concrete structure that's then stacked up in sections. Uh, there's a mastic layer, there's essentially a seal layer that goes in between those sections, but they, they don't, they're not watertight. Right. Um, so if you have groundwater that's sitting along that structure, it's going to find those holes, it'll weep into those manholes, and it'll ultimately hit the drain system. So, okay, um, thanks. Newer construction is better because things like sewer boots, there's, you know, rubber sewer boots that help seal pipes, but okay. especially older construction didn't benefit from all those leak, you know, leak preventing right. measures. So you just, it's a natural thing that happens in every system. There's no system that's perfectly watertight. That's, it's going to collect. Just another water. curiosity question. I built a building um, in downtown St. George like 30 years ago. And I remember when we took the sewer out to the street, it had the old clay pipes mm -hmm. from like, I don't know, pioneer days or whenever that was from, the yeah. 1920s or whatever. Do we have any of that in Washington still, or have we replaced all that? Or? I don't know that we have, you've got I'm just pipe. curiosity, I'm sorry. So. The very, very last of the clay pipe in Washington City was replaced about eight years ago. Okay. And it was uh, the area up in, uh, uh, north of the community center. Okay. That area right there was, was the last of the clay pipe. It's all been removed from the system. We don't okay. have any left that we're aware of. Okay, thanks. Another troublemaker was orange pipe, right? It was referred to as Orangeburg. Yes. You can think of it as a, a paper towel roll. <laughs> the roll that you throw in the garbage, they would take that paper towel roll, dip it in tar, and that became the pipe. <laughs> and it, we, we happen to be very, very lucky. Um, the bulk of our system was put in in the late 60s, early 70s, and that stuff had been outlawed by that time. So 
we don't see any of it, which is a good thing for us. <laughs> I've never heard of that pipe, so I'm glad it's not in the place anymore. Sounds interesting. Um, so, so back to these these demands. When we when we add the 188 and the 36, we get an average daily flow per ERU of 224 gallons per day. And I'll show you on the next slide how that compares to other communities in Washington County. It's right in that range of what we would expect for a city like Washington City. So it's right in that area that we would expect going into it. Based on looking at the diurnal or the daily flow variation through the meter data we have, so a lot of these meters that Lester has in his system are taking minute by minute measurements of that flow. And so it can measure as people wake up in the morning and they take their shower and they prepare for breakfast and all that stuff, the, the flows increase and that'll measure that increase. And so we look at those diurnal variations and determine that on average, the system peaks at about a 2.0 value, meaning that the peak flow is about two times higher than the average flow in the system. So when you apply that 2.0 factor to the domestic flow component, so two times the 188 plus the 36, again, the infiltration is going to be more of a base flow where it's not going to vary throughout the course of the day. It's going to kind of be a constant feed at 36 GP or gallons per day. We calculate or estimate your peak daily flow of roughly 412 gallons per day per ERU. And if for comparison purposes, if you compare that 412 to what the state would um, assign or what they would calculate, which is 250 gallons per day per person, and based on your household size, that's a pretty significant reduction in what the state would, would, would set out as your kind of your standard boilerplate standard value. So using the actual data is, is always beneficial in that sense that you can get a more customized tailored value that's, that's uh, specific to your system. As a comparison to other communities, these are other planning documents that are out there. So St. George right now, their current planning value is 247 gallons per day per ERU. Ivan's is 172, which you would, Ivan's is kind of more of a smaller, um, you know, smaller household size community. So you would expect Ivan's flows to be a little lower than, than average. And then Ash Creek Special Service District, which services Hurricane City, Laverkin and Tokerville right at 200 gallons per ERU. So like I mentioned, Washington City is right in that area about where we would expect you to be in terms of average daily flows in comparison to other communities across Washington County. So with that number established, our next task is to look at, um, we have our existing system flows and then forecasting those future flows. And then that'll segue into actually modeling and planning for the projects. So these planning, uh, these estimated growth rates come from your culinary water master plan. I think those have been discussed pretty well and have been vetted by the council. And so we've utilized those same planning values which are shown on that table to the right. And the master plan is going to cover a 20 year planning window. So based on these growth rates under our 10 year growth, we anticipate you're gonna add about just under 12,000 ERUs over the next 10 years. So averaging about 1200 ERUs per year. And then the subsequent 10 years after that, through 20 years, adding another 12,000 ERUs. So over the course of the next 20 years, uh, Washington City will, will more than double in size based on our current projection. Our current ERU was in the 17.5 Seven, range. 17, and so four, we're yeah. anticipating in the next 10 years, close to 12. And then in the next 10 year segment, another 12. Another 12. You can do some of that math. Wow. Yeah, so you're more than more than doubling the size of the city uh, based on that forecast. Right now we're here at 17 and, and we're, adding, we're adding 24 more. Um, last thing we want to cover with you today is, is our estimated distribution of growth. Now this is, when we have our growth numbers, we then take our best estimate in terms of where we anticipate that growth is going to occur. So looking at where you have those growth hotspots, where you have current projects, where those next pending projects are that are on the horizon. We sat down with Blake and Lester and Bud and kind of talked through this and identified the anticipated timing location of where you have these projects that are coming in. And then utilizing the current densities that are in your general plan for uh, allowable densities, we then determine the, the number of ERUs that we're gonna distribute to different locations throughout the system for modeling purposes. That makes sense. Keep in mind, it's not a perfect science, but but what we did sit down and look at with, with the Public Works Department did line up fairly well in terms of areas they identified as those growth hotspots. And then comparing the growth potential in, in this previous slide, things, things worked out fairly well in terms of how they fit. 
And so I'm going to walk through the next three, si three slides, which show um, some different areas of the city. So this first map, and just to kind of give you an idea, the colors on this map, the blue indicates the areas where we anticipate the focus of our 10-year growth, and the kind of red orangish color indicates where we anticipate the 20-year growth will be focused. So this is up kind of on the north side of the city. You can see I-15 and Telegraph through there. And so these areas are those that we've identified in the blue again, where you have these uh, focuses of growth. So it includes the Salente development, the Siena Hills. You have Long Valley on the, on the south end of the figure there, pieces of Coral Canyon, and then just some of these intermittent uh, undeveloped areas through uh, that part of Washington, kind of to the southwest there. I'll go ahead and jump to the next couple slides, and then if there's questions, I'm happy to answer any once we get through these next couple slides. This is kind of that middle region you can see on our key, looking at the middle of, of the map with that long valley area kind of on the upper end of that. Uh, we have some of the areas that are, uh, I guess, forecasted to annex into Washington City out there in the fields area, and then moving down into, I think, what is called Stuckey Farms, those areas. So again, these blue areas are where we've Coordination through public works is indicated these are where that growth is likely going to occur. Um, looking at the orange red areas, you have kind of that Warner Valley, Warner Valley area slated for potentially down the line, but also some other areas that we anticipate will uh, start to go within that 10 to 20 year time frame. And then lastly, down here by the St. George uh, Regional Airport, we have a good amount of projected growth along the Southern Parkway on the west side there along with some development down kind of on the east side of that road. And then again, with that long valley area coming in a little bit more into the future. And so those are the areas that we've identified that'll help kind of inform our modeling tasks as we take those 11,000 ERUs and those 12,000 ERUs and we allocate that in our hydraulic model to help determine where you have pipeline capacity bottlenecks and where those projects are going to be constructed to meet those needs of future growth. So next steps again, this is our, our foundation as we discussed, but our next steps are gonna be to final, develop and finalize our hydraulic computer uh, model of the sewer collection system. And with that model, we'll be able to identify any existing or projected future deficiencies that are in the system through that model. Based on those results, we'll determine the projects that are needed. We'll look at different alternatives and determine what projects can be constructed to mitigate or to, to correct those deficiencies, either whether they're existing or, or future. And then that'll help inform what goes into our capital facilities plan, which will essentially be that roadmap of the projects that, that the city will, will be building over the next 10 years, uh, well, into the next 20 years. But then looking at those 10-year projects, we'll then develop the impact fee facilities plan and impact fee analysis. And then lastly, once we have the impact fees done, we'll wrap it up with a user rate analysis for your monthly user rate. So that's where we're going. Uh, the stuff I presented before that, excuse me, is, is where we're at now. And so if you have questions, um, please uh, go ahead and ask away. I'm, I don't know if you're there yet, but just wondering what the, the big projects you anticipate coming, if, if you have them. If you don't, then that's fine. I just was thought I'd ask. We haven't gotten far enough along to, to, to answer that, but um, I mean, Washington is a fast growing community, so I would anticipate you're going to have some, some projects there. Um, uh, the benefit, I mean, one of the nice things is that you're, you're really only worried about collections right now because all your wastewater goes to St. George. So St. George takes care of all the wastewater once it gets to the treatment site is not there. But I would anticipate you're going to have some collection system improvements to, to, to think about there. Are there, is most of this able to be gravity run or are there other places where we need to have pumps that you anticipate? So we'll determine that. We're not quite to that point yet. We're building that model and then based on the topography, we'll have recommendations or if their topography is not conducive to running via gravity, then we'll have recommendations to say, hey, this basin here is going to require a lift station or some other sort of improvement because it, it won't flow via gravity. So we'll, I'm not quite to that point yet, but we're, we're moving toward that. So in your rate analysis, there's um, markers in there for growth for um, and all that but when you consider inflation and you consider cost of man hours cost of materials how do we work that in and how does that fluctuate going forward where if your if your analysis is low or high and how do we adjust that out for the actuals when we get closer to it you're talking about the rate analysis mm -hmm. yeah so in the rate analysis we'll we'll 
we'll capture everything into a into a, a model essentially we'll look at all of your existing expenses so what are your fixed costs just to run the system what are your forecasted costs of new capital projects how do impact fees work into that cash flow and then we'll determine based on that overall analysis what your rates need to be and we'll include an inflationary component in there to say hey things are going to keep going up the real the real remedy for for that is doing it frequently enough that you can course correct if if your current trajectory is not getting you where you need to go so typically you we encourage our clients to look at rate studies at the most every four to five years and not wait more than that because we'll build what we think is the best you know trajectory but if things become more expensive if we have things that we just couldn't predict and those rates need to change it just you want to review them frequently enough that you can course correct as you need to and not let them sit for for too long if that makes sense and adjust that rate either up or down adjust depending the yeah yep. on the current market or for current forecast yep typically whenever you update your master plan we'd recommend you update your rates along with that that's, that's the best time to do it Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, excellent presentation, and we will uh, we'll wait for the next steps then. Yeah, I think our next step will be to come in with some actual model results and say, hey, here's the, here's the projects that we're proposing, and we can dive into that uh, in a little more detail. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, well done. Lester, do you have anything to add to this? I, I do not. I think Aaron did a good job for me. Okay. So, Mayor, I don't know if we... Uh, if we want this uh, presentation in our packets or not. I don't know if that's, if it's ready to be put out, but. Uh, yeah, I'm confident that uh, Aaron can share that with the uh, recorder and that can be distributed to the council. Mayor, since we're moving along so quickly, I think uh, it'd be great to introduce Bud Smitherman too. I, he's our new sewer supervisor. We had him come all the way here and put on a collar shirt and everything. So I think. Uh, you know, I think that's a great nice idea. To introduce um, to the council. Lester's going to make some room there at the podium and Bud can come up and tell us a little bit about himself and about what you do. And you look sharp. Thanks for being here. And thanks for the work you do. Tell, tell us about yourself and what you do. Oh, yeah, you guys really caught me off guard there. So um, I'll try to do the best I can. But no, I'll, I'll do better. <laughs> Coming up to two years here working with the city of Washington. It's been quite the experience and actually a pretty big learning curve, though. But hopefully I can help uh, with the knowledge that I have to keep this project going. And, um, you know, I like, I like collecting data and uh, trying to see where it goes from there. And then these guys do even better work than I can ever imagine to do. So, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. T tell us uh, who you work with. Have you got a few guys you work with? And I got four guys under me right now. Um, yeah, they're pretty green, but hopefully I can get them up to the level where I want them to be. So, and then, um, yeah, so. <laughs> and you're implementing, as I understand, a fair amount of, pretty high tech procedures in as you, you check the lines and you check the flows. I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of technology you're using. Yeah. So yeah, going from basic cleaning operations, just keeping your city, uh, sewer moving the way it should be uh, into St. George and it's their problem from there. But, uh, from then, then, uh, TV inspection after that, so we can have a visual representation of what it is. And then the metering portion is actually seeing where the flows are at and, uh, where we need improvements. So, Pretty, uh, we uh, added some trunk lines within the last few years that that uh, have been part of the system I now. Some, uh, pretty good ones coming along the line, but uh, there is still in the works. Yeah, and a lot of it too is like trying to find uh, better ways to just move the water where we can work with it a lot easier than what we have right now. So, yeah. uh, actually impressed. Like I said, when you guys talked about the clay sewers and the Orangeburg and stuff. I'm really glad we don't have that here. So. <laughs> Had to do that a lot over at St. George, so I put you know 15 years of work over there dealing with that. So, but. Uh, Council, what questions do you have for our first supervisor here? Well, Mayor, I can vouch for this guy because he grew up on my street, oh. Quail Ridge Drive, so he's a good guy. So I've known him since you were probably what 10 or something. Yeah, something like that. So, so, yeah. yeah, I've come from my father. He put in he put in uh, 30 years with City of St. George. As well. Yes, he so, did. So once a work. One sewer worker to the next. So. Yep, his dad was a legend. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I think just to add to that, our sewer employees, it's the definition of they're taken for granted until something goes wrong, right? I mean, yeah. it, we just, we have such a good sewer department and it, it's because of those employees who are out there every day doing it. We just don't have a lot of problems. But, but again, we get really used to flushing and, and taking showers and just having everything work right, but it's a lot of work. So really appreciate you and your 
your employees, let them know how much we appreciate them. If you don't have those phone calls, then I'm doing my job right, so. <laughs> Well, like I say, on behalf of the, you know, the council, we, we do really appreciate you, bud. And if you'd please pass that along to to your employees and those you work with, uh, we don't we don't take you for granted. <laughs> Absolutely. So. And we're we're going to make sure we keep we keep up with what we need to with that part of our in infrastructure in the city. So, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, guys. All right, we do have a hard stop at five thirty, so we've got about forty five minutes up to forty five minutes for our last item. And that's going to be the pull attachment license agreement. I'll invite our power director, Rick Hansen, to come and present on this item. And appreciate you sending over a little uh, light reading material in advance on this to cut our teeth on. You guys really know how to plan a meeting. It's nothing more exciting than <laughs> sewer master plan and pull attachment policy. So. We, we really try. <laughs> we talked about cotton days. I mean, we tried to lighten up the mood a yeah. little bit. <laughs> um, we'll have a similar. Hey, bud, take some of these berries. Yeah, take, take some home and take a few to your guys, too, okay? They're do what you got to do to get a nice big handful there. And... <laughs> no. <Nah>, I... <laughs> Take, no, take more than that. Take a big handful. Yeah, take a, yeah. take it really, take a, there you go. There you go. That's better. That's how we do it. All right, Rick. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, and in fact, we're, that's actually a good lead in to what you'll be seeing and probably in the next couple months on the power side, we're doing similar planning and uh, concepts will be used there too. So let me see if I can get my screen to share if Steve will let me um, as the mayor said I gave you a little bit of light reading of 85 pages of it totally excitement uh, I'm I'm quite certain councilman Coates read every page I, I doubt that. Yeah, yeah, I doubt that too. <laughs> but I did sit through it in power board and learned a lot. So. Oh, that's true. There you go. So, so the the reason for this, uh, there, there's there's several reasons. Uh, just to note, there at the top, the the power board did review this on our meeting on the fifth. They recommended to the council to approve it. And really, what we're asking you to approve is. I guess a form of the agreement because there's really not an exact counterparty at this time uh, but it would give us as staff the ability to work with Lumen TDS and as long as it doesn't change significantly from what we present I think we could proceed with you know entering into those agreements with those companies um, as far as I know and no one can find there is no current Pole attachment policy in the city with either TDS or CenturyLink Lumen. Uh, I don't know if one ever existed, to be honest, from, from what we can tell. Uh, so we've got the two existing attachers, as well as there's some other companies that have started to poke around, you know, what would it take to get on your poles and those kind of things. So uh, this has actually been something I've been working on for a long time off and on, it hasn't been a fire, uh, but I think there's uh, a few things that are uh, bringing it to the forefront. One of them, Lumen currently has an application for about 160 poles uh, that they've submitted to us. And so we need to get this in place and um, we'll go through these paragraphs fairly quickly or as fast as you want. Uh, of try to summarize what the, all the language in the agreement does. Uh, but the pull attachment uh, agreement, not only, I think the initial thing you talk, or think about is what the fee is on an annual basis for that attachment. That's one of the things it does, but more importantly, I think it, it establishes the processes, the requirements that a company needs to meet in order to attach to, to our polls. Um, and it, it outlines a application process. In fact, the one that Lumen has submitted, I'd send them some 
sections out of this document saying it's not official yet, but this is where we're headed. And they, for the most part, complied with, with that. Uh, the companies are required to do both a, a pulse strength and clearance analysis to make sure the, the lines they throw up aren't too low. Uh, of course, they're the, typically the lowest on the pole, so they're the first ones to get snagged and pull the pole, pole line over. And so they need to demonstrate that their installation would meet all the NESC clearance requirements, that the poles are strong enough. Uh, and then one other area that we've had struggles with in the past, uh, when we like rebuild a line, we did one on 300 North. It's probably, we're probably approaching 18 months ago and we finally got the last poles for them to transfer uh, about three or four weeks ago. So sometimes it's taken them a year or longer to move their lines to the new poles so we can get rid of the old poles and it just leaves clutter. And, and so it establishes some shot clocks, if you will, uh, that they, once that's done, they have, I think it's 90 days, if I remember right, to, to move, unless they make arrangements with us, you know, sometimes there's circumstances, but we can work with them. Uh, all the language is, I'd say 95% of it is from the APPA or the American Public Power Association. They have a guide document uh, that we uh, obtained. And so it's based on that, which is vetted across the country. Uh, city manager, city attorney has looked at their appropriate portions of the document as well. Uh, and the agreement's intended to cover wireline attachments, you know, they go linear, linearly with us. Uh, overlashing is where they'll stick a new cable on an existing one and then spin the little wire over it. Um, it also identifies that if they have cables up there that aren't being used, that they need to remove them, which they don't like to do because it's a cost. And sometimes it's difficult because they like to overlash the new stuff on the old and now the old stuff's buried in the middle so it's hard to get out so it gives us some ability to enforce that and then uh, I'm not sure if any of you were here back in April of 19 and remember the small cell uh, <laughs> I was on there uh, the small cell uh, at the time was kind of a hot topic and so instead of having multiple agreements uh, I've incorporated that into this document as well of what we did then. So those are... Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and it out, again, it outlines standards of what they would have to do to attach to our poles. And, and did we ever get any of the small cell attachments? We have a, it was a big issue back in the day. Yeah. They wanted to put like a refrigerator Right. essentially on our poles and so it was a big issue but it's kind of nice to hear they didn't yeah didn't we have not impacting us we had a couple poke around back then but we haven't had anything since uh, the discussion was if we if we wrote a little bit of an ordinance at least we could control that if we didn't have it then they could kind of jam whatever they wanted on our poles and uh, exactly and that's so. the same intent with this is right that uh, we can have some control uh, we have had instances in the past, uh, it was probably about six months ago, one of the companies put up a, a new messenger. Uh, we questioned, you know, and they didn't even talk to us at that time. Uh, and of course that messenger got snagged by a, a crane going in to put an air conditioner on a top of a house. Uh, fortunately, it didn't do any severe damage. Uh, but those are the kind of things we're trying to avoid with this. They have to demonstrate that they meet all the, the requirements. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we had UFS, which is the same company, excuse me, that uh, has done our impact fees and our rate study. Uh, so they, we sent them information on the number of poles, the cost of poles, to come up with an updated rate. Uh, and they use, they recommended using the FCC pole attachment formula, which in my opinion actually is errors 
is very conservative on our side of what we could charge. Um, I think they use more of the pole than what that formula. It's really the FCC obviously is slanted towards the communication companies and keeping their costs down. So this is conservative. They recommended using that, particularly if you ever were to end up in court, it would be very easy to defend, uh, more so than some of the other methods. Uh, basically, each attachment they assign that they it uses a foot of the pole. Uh, again, in order, our poles could, if, if there was just a single communication line on, typically our poles could be four to five feet shorter um, because there's a separation we have to include in there between the two types of utilities. Uh, so it, it kind of, that's where I say I, th I think we could actually charge more than a foot worth um, because it does force us to put taller poles in. May I ask a question? Sure. Is there a minimum? I remember one time working at a lot where the, uh, the cement truck almost got snacked on a, mm -hmm. you know, on a low, I'm guessing it was a communications line. Generally. Is there like a height requirement that they have to be up above a certain yes. height? Yes, or? definitely. Uh, and, and again, that's what I, the NESC that I refer to is the National Electric Safety Code that governs utilities. Uh, and it's typically about 15 and a half feet uh, for the hottest day of the year at the mid span. And that's what they have to demonstrate. 15 and a half feet above the grade? Yes. Okay. And there, there's, you can go lower than that if it's not subject to vehicle traffic. So like if you're in a backyard scenario where all there is is pedestrians, it can, I think, goes to about 12, 13 feet. But yes, so that's exactly what we're trying to get to here. Yeah, this one was right along the road, you know, say right above the curb. And so it was it was pretty low. That's the first time I'd we've, ever seen it. We've Cement had, truck almost snag a line. So. We have had and we still have a few low spots on our system. Okay. That we're gradually trying to get those Lift them off. Them. Uh, so we gave UFS uh, cost to typically install just a blank pole with no other thing than just the pole and grounding on it. And then they, and we gave them counts of how many poles, the size from our GIS system. Make a long story short, they come out with a recommended fee of this 1371 per pole per year. Um, our current fee is $6 as far as I can tell again that probably hasn't changed in 30 maybe even 40 years since the city bought the system so it seems like a pretty dramatic hasn't changed since Sherry's been involved in cotton days it sounds like probably not uh, and so it seems like a fairly dramatic increase the 128 percent but in reality I think they've been getting a really good deal for a long time but Rick to say that cost how many poles there are like like uh, you get an explanation in PowerPoint and it was like, it was like, instead of like $1,500, it was 3000. It wasn't like a, yeah, TDS has 680 poles currently and Lumen has 150. So we're not talking huge dollars. Yeah. So even if you say a thousand poles at 13, that's $13,000 a year between the two companies. Mm. It's, it's pretty minor. And so again, it's not so much the fee it's, Getting the installations correct is what we're trying to establish with this policy. And update the fee. And update the fee, yes. But the fees, like I say, it's not going to make or break us. Uh, it's just not that much money in the overall scheme of things. But getting them to comply with codes so we don't have the cement trucks hitting them is what we're really trying to, to get out here. So, uh, I don't know if any of if any in your reading, if you had any section you really wanted to dive into, I doubt it. Uh, you won't hurt my feelings. It's all fascinating, know. so it's just you know, any, <laughs> yeah, line by line. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we can talk as much or as little as you you would like on it, but but that's the goal. And I know Jeremy and Thad have had the chance to look at it probably in more detail. They can comment accordingly. 
Mayor, I have a couple of questions if you're ready. Councilman. So really what we're doing here is trying to set the rate and the processes to move forward, right? Yep. So in areas where we have overhead, it's obvious what we're talking about poles, but in some areas we're underground. Do they like to access, are there, are there conduits in place when, for those areas that are underground areas or? We don't have any city owned conduits. So they would need to run to. their own for underground yes. then. Okay. Um, and so, typically Councilman Ivy, they, any new construction, the, the TDS and those guys bring out the conduits during that. And it's might be in the same church, but it's their own conduits. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they own them then. Okay, thank Correct. you. So we're not going to get rich doing this, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, but it's a good service to our citizens. But what type of contingencies do we have? Let, let's say just by chance that uh, it was determined that TES or one of the other companies there they they damaged the pole for whatever reason. Now, of course, is it built? I'm sure it's built in that they would have to replace the pole or or get it back up to. To serviceable condition that's probably just common sense right that they would yeah the, the way it's if they were to damage the pole we would replace it and build them for it it's, okay it's, we don't allow outside unless under very unusual circumstances it would typically be our crews that do it so what about the opposite let's say that i know we had one car that had ran into a pole and we've had fire you know, that's gotten the poles where their product is damaged on our pole. What does that look like? Who, who pays for that? We would, you know, typically if it's a car and they, we, they don't run off or whatever and we can find them, the insurance covers those costs and we would replace the pole and then they're responsible to put their own system back together and if they wanted to make a claim with that same insurance, they would so have to So vehicle insurance? Yes. Okay. So. So if, if there's there's at least two companies that, that do this, how many companies can we have represented on a pole? Can they be side by side, run the same height? Or? They're, they're typically vertical, spaced about a foot apart. Uh, I was in Hawaii this last couple of weeks and they have some crazy stuff they do over there. Uh, so, I mean, you can do them side by side, but typically they're vertical, that's what we'd want to see. It just, if you get them stuck out, it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for our crew, crews to climb it because you can't get your legs up and around them. So typically they're vertical. So if by adding a second uh, utility or a uh, communication connection there, we needed a taller pole, and if, then, and if a taller pole was needed, then they would also have to pay the cost of a taller pole. Correct. And if you look in the document, that's a good point. It's called make ready work. So through this process, if we uh, identify they got to replace five poles for either strength or height, they have to pay for that. And you ever had ever had situations where where by adding those extra wires that we have to guide the poles differently and, and if so, who is it the companies that pay for that as well? Yeah, they have to guide their own lines. They can't use our guys and it's specifically noted in here they couldn't use our, our anchors unless we give them permission in writing. There's occasions that it makes sense to do, but by and large, they have to put their own anchors and guys and, and on that. So. And how about, uh, are, I know it's probably a good idea to do routine inspections. Is there anything here that that requires them to do visual inspections periodically to make sure that things are going well with their components that are on our poles? Or do we? I know we probably do routine inspections as well, but I would like to say we could do more than we. It would so be just, great just to say have it then. Time, but, yeah. <laughs> There's generally not tons of inspections other than people driving around working on the system is where we see most of it. And if we see a problem, uh, we'll notify them. And occasionally they've called us and said, hey, we were working on this pole. We noticed your wires flapping or something, you know. So the, the crews in the field are good at working back and forth with each other, so. Thank you. Further discussion on this? It's uh, an action item on the regular meeting. Sounds like we're ready to go ahead and move forward on that and keep that on the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Rick.
Good work. Wow. Time to spare. Early. Thank you. And that's the last item on our workshop agenda. I'll call for a motion to adjourn until our regular meeting at six o'clock. So, so moved. moved. Second. Have a motion by Councilman Bellison, second by Councilman Coates. All in favor? Aye. We stand adjourned.
Are you, are you putting I'm trying to start a meeting here, Councilman. Okay. It's six o'clock, straight up, maybe five or six seconds after six o'clock. We're here at Washington City Hall, and we have reconvened for our regular meeting. And uh, we are grateful for Sharon Shores with the Universal Life Church Ministries, uh, who will... Um, Come forward and speak to us and give us the invocation. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for those that don't know, the St. George Interfaith Council makes up about 38 different churches, denominations, with at least 15 varieties, including Baha'i, Quaker, uh, Muslim, Islam, all right, along with the traditional Catholic, Presbyterian, and all the others, all those other churches. Um, we sponsor Harmony Day every year. This was the second one this year. We sponsored the Crop Walk, by the way, which the mayor participated in. So next year, Mayor, bring the city council along with you, <laughs> okay? You know I will. All right, and then we also sponsor prayer over the city every New Year's Day, so we participate in that. All right, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with open hearts and minds, seeking your wisdom, guidance, and discernment as we move through our lives and as we move through this meeting this evening. We pray our leaders are guided by your wisdom as they make decisions for this community. As we are all part of this great community, we are also all children of God, sons and daughters of the living God. We pray that we acknowledge our differences as we seek out our common ground, each of us working for the good of all. As we grow as individuals, let us also grow as community, emulating your love to all. We recognize in this world that there is much hurt and sorrow that confound us, deeds and actions for which we can find no justification. Yet we also know that there is untold good, folks that work every day for the benefit of all people. Let us stand with those who are doing good. We pray that while we recognize the occasional tiredness in our bodies and in our hearts, that we call upon you for the strength that we might be the best person that we are called to be. Yet, yes, let's let us all be the good we want to see in others. Let us work to be the change that we seek. In this season, let us invest some of our time into quiet reflection and renewal forming the path for a greater and more loving 2024. Let us all be sowers of all that is good, all that is uplifting, and all that adds faith, hope, and love to this world. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that you do in the community, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here with us this evening. I've asked Councilman Brett Henderson if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council, we do not have need to go to closed session this evening. So I'll turn to you for a, an approval of the agenda as outlined. Here I can make the approval of our agenda for our regular council meeting, March 24th, 2024, 27th, excuse me. Have a motion by Councilman Ivey. Second. Second by Councilman Henderson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The agenda is approved. Moving on to announcements. Of just a few things as we kind of get into spring here. The uh, annual Lions Club Easter egg hunt will be at Veterans Park on Saturday, March 30th at 9.30 a.m. It's a wonderful opportunity. The candy goes quick. And no, Jeremy, it's not for adults. It's for the kids. And then uh, just personally, and as from, from, from those of us here, just 
remind you of the special um, Sunday, March 31st is Easter and wish you a happy Easter and in that day for you. On um, Friday, April 5th at 6 p.m., there's a first Friday music night here at Veterans Park that's hosted by the Washington Area Chamber. At the same time, Friday, April 5th at 6 p.m., Washington City Public Safety, police officers, firefighters, and local athletes will be competing against the city of St. George in, a, in the Money Good Celebrity Flag football game. It's a tight series. We're going into our third game. We've, we're, we've both won one game. We're hoping to get the advantage this year. Although we are gonna be on their home turf. It's at Dixie High School. Uh, so uh, the important thing about that is that the real winners are those that receive services from the Children's Justice Center. And so um, if you have a chance to come out and participate in that, it's a small entrance fee and the donations would be much appreciated. On Monday, April 15th, the Was Washington County will be uh, holding their parade in Washington City. It's The parade starts at 6 p.m. The lineup is between 4.30 and 5.30 up near the community center on 300 East. Council, for any of you interested in the Utah League of Cities and Towns mid-year conference at the Dixie Center, it's um, April 17th through the 19th, but primarily April 18th um, and a little bit the morning of April 19th. If you wanna register for that, reach out to the recorder and then as we heard in our work session, uh, Cotton Days will be celebrated from April 22nd through April 28th. Uh, the parade is, will be on April 27th, starting at 9 a.m., followed by the Cotton Fest activities at the park and around town. So there'll be a lot of fun activities during the week. Is there anything that uh, I may have missed? Mayor, I just wanted to make the announcement on the trail letter that we signed. Oh, go ahead, apparently. Councilman. So, sure. Just for the record, uh, uh, we, we have a letter that we were to apply for some grant funding, not for us, but for UDOT for the Southern Parkway Trail. And so the council had agreed to sign a support letter for it, and Paul Walker with our Parks Department is going to work that through. So I just want to thank the council for looking at that and, and, and making sure we do support UDOT, because that is a good thing to get the active transportation, especially to get off that road. That road has become a very busy road, and I think it's beneficial. So thank you, Council. Good job. Um, by chance, is, are there, I don't think so, but is there a representative online or here from Tuacon? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is declaration of abstentions and conflicts. Anything to declare this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to the... Item, the next item, which is the consent agenda, which is the approval of minutes, consideration to approve the minutes from City Council meeting 313-24, and that's it. Call for a motion on that item. So moved, Mayor. Have a motion by Councilman Coates. Is there a second? I'll second that, Mayor. Second by Councilman Ivey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Consent agenda is approved. We'll move on to the next item, which is public hearing. This is item five. And I will make note that we did not receive any electronic public comment prior to the meeting. Is there anyone in the audience that is here for item 5A, which is the public hearing for this evening? Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and read this item. Uh, this is a public hearing and consideration to approve an ordinance for general plan G-24-02 amendment amending the moderate income housing element of the general plan, proposing new dates for when the strategies are to be completed. City planner Eldon Gibb, you give us an update on this. The council is already quite familiar with this item. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Yes, this item is to amend dates of the moderate income housing. Uh, we had a healthy discussion a few weeks back. Um, 
we proposed to participate in the land trust um, and determined the timing wasn't right to do that. So to stay in compliance with state requirements, uh, we need to push back some due dates, which I've highlighted in the report there, and I'm happy to discuss, answer any questions you may have. Questions, comments for the city planner? Thank you, Eldon. A discussion amongst the council, or are we ready for a motion? I'll make a motion that we, um, well, do we close the public hearing? I don't even open the public hearing. Maybe we should um, do that first. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone who would like to come forward? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and turn to Councilman Coates for a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve general plan G-2402, amending the modern income housing elements of the general plan with the new dates. I have a motion by Councilman Coates, second by Councilman Belliston. Let's go roll call. We'll start with Casperson. Aye. Ivy. Aye. Coates. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Belliston. Aye. It's approved unanimously. Item six, ordinance. 6A, this is a continuation of consideration to approve an ordinance for zone change request Z-23-13 from open space to PUDR residential located at approximately Highland Parkway and Vineyard Road. Uh, Community Development Director Drew Ellerman, we present to the council on this item. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item was tabled during your February 28th 2024 council meeting to allow the applicant to make changes to the plan at your request. Since that meeting, the applicant has removed the slope hillside out of the individual lots and identified this hillside area as open space and no disturb open space, by the way. Uh, the applicant has identified the LID requirements and is planning to install Coltec chambers to meet this requirement. And lastly, the applicant has placed a note on the plat that two-story homes are not permissible and then one of the, I think the conditions will be that on the final plat, there will be a uh, general note that says no two story homes in the subdivision as well. So we'll have that. So that's the update on here. Everything else has kind of remained the same. Hope you had a chance to look at it and be glad to answer any questions. I will remind you the planning commission's recommendation since it's been a while. Uh, by a vote of three to one, they recommended approval of Z-23-13 uh, for this change from open stays to the open space to the proposed plan unit development residential. So again, I'll be glad to answer any questions the council might have. Thank you, Drew. And I'll invite the applicant up here in a moment, but before I do council, are there questions for staff? So Drew, I was just wondering um, about how a, a walkout basement would apply, where it has to be 50 feet off the rim, you know, and all that. It just, is it implied that you can't build a walkout or is it still possible? Well, that's, that's a challenging question because the way the city looks at a walkout basement, they consider it a single story home. Because it's, it's determined by the view from the street side. So that's why people have come and seen a three story home on the back and say, well, the city doesn't allow three story homes. And I said, well, we would determine everything from the street side just as a sample for that. So, but that's a good question is, is that so. Um, I don't know what the topography is up here currently. I don't know if there's any land that would warrant that without them digging down um, in, because I think it's a fairly flat piece, but it's something we could ask the applicant. But that's, that is a good question when it comes to hillside about a walkout, because yeah, from the back, it'll look two story, but by what, how we view things as a city and our policy as we look from what, the, what it is on the street view. I'm supposed to go right to left, so. Now again, this is a zone change, so I don't know if we have a topography, there it is. Sometimes we don't put them in zone changes, but on plats we do, so. But it's a P B U D, so it should have topography with it, with a zone change. So, I mean, just looking at it, there's a few of the lots there where it looks like there's maybe a 12 foot drop from the curb to the you know, back of the lot. If the back of the lot is the, uh, you know, the ridge line, so. Based on the grading, it shows that they're gonna have potential walkouts. Well, is, is that 
That's what the suggested. That's current topography, right? Yeah, but they no zoom up. They're, the green lines are proposed, so they're only going to grade the road in. That's the only plan, is my understanding. Looking at this, okay. so they wouldn't be padded lots. But they're still required to be fifty foot off the rim for a single story in this case, though. Is that right, Drew? Yeah. That is correct. So on some of those lots, I mean, the, you know, you've got probably two choices. You can either, you know, if you've got, say, a 10 or 12 foot drop from front to back, you can either fill it and have some retaining on the back side that we'll all see, or you could do a walkout basement and slope it down, you know, down the sides of the house. So I don't know if that's something we want to address or from a hillside perspective I mean I, I don't know but that's so some councilman, of those lots are going to have that issue so councilman I think just the, the hillside is the 50 foot for a single story I think that's that's kind of standard so why I mean why don't you just amend the condition that says single story single story slab on grade That's how I feel. I think it should be consistent with everything else that's been on that ridge line. And I think that that goes to what our intent was. Anyway, I won't, I won't speak for you, but for me was that we want to preserve that that high land, high area, you know, that that's not all houses that are that obscure the, the ridge line and stuff. So yeah. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, but just keep I'm just throwing you, you know, information. So that single story home it's not going to be any taller than a walkout because the part that's at the single story is the height, right? It's just the look from I the And it's the appearance. Yeah, I just want to make sure that was clear that, yeah. you know, we're not bringing the houses because of that. They're still going to be the same height they were of, of a slab on grade or a walkout basement, the height-wise, but the appearance of a two in the back versus a one. That's right. So I have a question on lot 18 and 19. So the property line ends where the black line is, correct? uh y yes so the ridge line they're just drawing the ridge line going out i just didn't know it i want to be sure that the lot line didn't go clear out to the ridge line that's right there yeah well again this just see where i might no i, I see what, yeah and, and i'd rather i'll get that verified by the applicant but this is the property now they could own that property and put it in but that'll come at platting time right that's all, that's owned by coral canyon so i just i want to i was just trying to see and, and what stemmed my thought is just how the the block walls come in the future however they come when we build up there yeah just having a weird block wall that comes out for whatever reason i just Again, it's it's a weird knob, and it's, it'd be better to cut it flat. Just cut it across to the property line and go up. I just wanted to clarify that that's not in their property. That little segment. So, is it okay, Mayor, if I just kind of walk through something in my please, head? Please, this is the time. Okay, so so the development to the south, they built up pads on all their lots as so they build them. You know, just flat lots, and then. Um, you know, they did the rocks in the back, the retainers, and painted them and everything. So, so, so that's all flat. It looks uniform across there. So the way this is being proposed would be just the road would be graded, right, to grade. Is that true? That's how I see it. So it would look more similar to what Foremaster Ridge looks like. From the, you know, like if you're standing down in St. George City, you're looking up at Foremaster Ridge, you can see that there's a wide variety of stuff going on up there with walkout basements. Some of them are single level on slab that have the retaining in the back, so you got a lot of different things going on up there. So this would look very uniform until it hit this development, and then it would look like Four Master Ridge. So, so if we approve it just like this, you know that's that's what it would look like. So. This is good discussion. Further discussion, council, amongst yourselves or with staff before I invite the applicant forward? I think I'd like to hear from the applicant. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Tate Murphy to come forward with Elevate and be 
Happy to answer questions, I'm sure. Of course, thanks for having me again. Um, to the point of walkout basements, I mean, on some of the lots, hypothetically, yeah, um, it is possible. I mean, obviously the height would still be the same. Um, with that being said, there's a ton of rock up here, right? And so the feasibility of that actually happening is a little bit of a different story. I mean, there's a lot of blasting that has to go on. I mean, we didn't anticipate um, a lot of basements, if any, just because of the sheer amount of blasting that would need to take place in order to go down deep enough for a basement. So is your plan to just grade the road? Yeah, and then each lot would be individual landscaped. So how, I'm just talking, how do we, how do we control I shouldn't say control, I should say help the hillside committee. So each, every single one of these lots, if they go to develop their lot, would have to go to hillside. I mean, because of the topography that they're, Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, but unless they go into that area, they don't have to go to hillside individually, correct? Well, they probably wouldn't unless they're disturbing the hillside. And if I know anything, people want to maximize their property that they have. And so I just, yeah. I've sat through St. George City Councils where each home individual has to come in one at a time. I'm just kind of talking about potentially we'd be having this discussion about the ridge line and grading and setting those grades with every single property owner. And oh, by the way, you got to stain your rocks black to match the appeal. So that's, that's where I'm a little... I just want to do it once and get it done. It's kind of where I'm at on the so, path. So, Councilman Coates, uh, I, and Mr. Murphy, I, I understand you say that, you know, there's a lot of blasting, but never underestimate a kid from Colorado City in a traco and a hammer. Because <laughs> I've dug a lot of holes in, in rock, right? So, I think if we're going to, because it's a PUD, if we're going to get some conditions in there on, on you know how that's going to look we ought to have that in here at this point because you're going to be selling these lots right so you know it's not so much what uh elevate's going to do it's down the road as people come in individually yeah. and say you know how they want to do it we we want somewhat of a uniform look all the way around the the perimeter so but is that appropriate um, to do now and have it done now I, i'm if, just if i was doing it i would I would just get all of the lots to to grade, grade them, and and have the retaining walls in place. We have an ordinance that says if you have so much slope between lots that uh, that they they have to be retained, right? It's more than yeah, three from feet. yeah from side to side you would back wooden, I, but side to side. But in, yes, but in this case they're not showing that these are pad grade lots. They're That's sure, right. They're showing that it's but but the road, road might determine a lot of that, right? Once the road's cut, we'll have a whole but lot better understanding we of can that. understand it based on the grading that they propose i can tell right now that some could be walkouts some could not depending on what people want to do um, yeah. i agree with you no one's going to probably put basements but a walkout you could see if you put your house in the right spot well we just i mean if that's a concern and it doesn't sound like you would have an issue because you're selling the lot right yeah i mean i we would like to because if someone wants more space and we've already taken away the second story i think we'd like to preserve the ability for someone to Get, you know, put the square footage on that they are desiring, but I mean, if that's a, a non-starter. Well, I, I don't know if we could limit a basement. It would just not have to be a walkout basement. Well, don't, I mean, but does that make sense that if somebody wanted the room and wanted to dig a basement, but it just could not be a walkout basement? Well, Drew, a lot of subdivisions, we require them to have the, the pad grade set at by the developer, right? We require that. So we require that the, the grade, all the lot gradings done so that we know where where that's at i mean I, you know the challenge is when you're you've got multiple people and multiple builders northridge there was a big problem with it where you know they go in and and they didn't have the retaining walls in place and so then guys are trying to cut in and cut retaining walls and it's like well this benefits both of our properties and the, the guy next door says well pound sand i'm not paying anything for it and it just became kind of a nightmare and so we started requiring more and more about the, the, the grades need to be set between the lots and, and Pad graded. If you, if you want to do a walkout, then you're going to grade that walkout. If you want to do a slab on grade, then you're going to grade that slab on grade. Would that come yeah. at preliminary plat then? No, we would do it because it's PUD. We do it now. We establish those grades. We now. can establish the condition. The yeah, condition, now and then a preliminary plat. You can preliminary show. plat. You have the, your construction yeah. drawing show. So then we just a couple of things. Number one, we 
uh, would establish a condition that the lots all need to be graded slab on grade. That single story slab on single grade. story slab on grade. Any retaining walls around the perimeter need to be, you know, consistent. They need to be stained black basalt rock. To match the consistent. Now, with is that area. in between lots you want that or anything no, on the back? On the anything on the perimeter on the, the perimeter, outside? Perimeter. Yep. yep. And then if they choose not to do a wall and they choose to do slope, it has to be irrigated landscaped because that was the other condition we had and they usually choose to. And that means set a meter, pay the meter fees, go through that, landscape it to cover up those elevated scars, I guess I would call them. Right. Max height is 35 feet, right? From no. For a home? For, from the street. Yeah. It's actually from not the finished grade. One, if it's single story, so max height is not 35. <laughs> well, that's the thing, that's, though, on a single story. If someone wanted to do that, they technically could. Yeah. I don't know. I know they wouldn't. Okay. Now, wait a second. Somebody could go 35 foot with a single story house. Yep. They could, because it doesn't differentiate two story. It just says the height. Exactly. Well, we'll talk about it. Well, now, wait a minute. No, thing. let's see. We call that a 2412 pitch. <laughs> and and 24 foot ceiling plates. I actually think Coral Canyons is a 25 max on the single story. It's in, in Coral Canyon. Canyon. They, I think they might have been 25 feet. If it is, yeah, we're not in the Coral Canyon, but. No, we're not. I'm just saying that's Yeah, the I just want. Yeah. I think Coral Canyon does, I think, have that. Now, I doubt someone's going to go do that. That would just be insane. As soon as you say that. I know, but so I got a question on the. I'm going to switch subjects unless you guys want more discussion. Uh, I was just going to say um, to Mr. Murphy, I appreciate you, you know, pulling back in the top of that slope and deeding that on, you know, the perimeter to open space, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, you don't get those back, those slopes. So, can you clarify my question on 18 yeah. and 19? Is yeah, your the dashed line is the property line. Okay. So we were just outlining where the ridge line is just for visibility. Purposes. I figured I just was a mind trick. That's all part of the Coral Canyon HOA. Okay. And then my other question is what, just I didn't see where you're, you identified where the trails were, but you didn't identify, unless I missed it, which ones are going to be constructed at this time, which ones are asphalt, which are concrete, which are dirt, if you're having dirt. Yeah, I mean, we should put it, the, I mean, all the meandering trails are, are asphalting right to make it and then street yeah the street yeah that because that, that ties into the asphalt trails that are around they're just not those aren't on the street those are on the perimeter right yeah. so i wanted them on the perimeter i understand it's not a thing that people care i mean everyone's yeah, fine but, with them where they're at I, I i like asphalt trails but i think on the street does our public work wants concrete that's what we've done in other areas Where's that road section? Yeah, so I guess I'll, the applicant, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, included, it did include that five feet to the side. I mean, yeah. I think it would make sense to match it with, with asphalt, but I guess that's, I mean, if it's gonna be meandering, it's kind of. If, if it's within the 15 feet, I think it makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, I was just going to point out we do we have let them do asphalt as long as it's not tied to the back of the curb. It has to meander like this one is. Um, but we but if it's on we the back of the curb, we make it a we ten did. foot sidewalk for the trail. Then it has to be concrete. But we did it down in the fields. And just so you know, some of those spaces with only fifteen feet, it doesn't. You know, I know with a ten foot trail, it's. I mean, you get like a random tree here and there. Like I'd almost rather just put the asphalt or concrete against the curb and put a, put a five foot landscape buffer along the edge, just so you get a bulk of landscaping. But and don't meander it; make it straight. And on, the, on the roads, I just think the concrete looks a lot better too if it's going to be parallel to the curb and gutter. But running on concrete. Around grapevine crossing. <laughs> That's true. Around grapevine crossing down below, you know they've got that ten foot trail, but it's offset away from the back of the curb by five feet so they've got some landscaping strip between and yeah. keeps the the, the tr pedestrian traffic a little bit
bit further away from the vehicular traffic, so. But to meander a 10 foot wide trail, you didn't yeah. have that, you'd have to have 20 feet. Yeah, I, I, I'd probably just do a five foot landscaping strip and then the 10 foot trail. That's what I would rather do. And we're, we're fine with that. We just knew you liked the meandering down below, but we understand it's different conditions. So and we're, we're happy with either way. Yeah. We like meandering when it goes with the natural of the hillside or whatever. Makes sense. It breaks up those straight lines. Mayor, may I ask? Please go ahead, Councilman. Drew, just for my own curiosity, um, you know how on some of the houses we build, we have like a 1.5 story, like up in the rafters or bonus, bonus area. room or something. Yeah. Does the city consider that a two story or a single, or how does that work? Because I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, you could go and put a single story house with a 12 12 pitch built within and, the attic yeah, area. Yeah. How does the city look at that, Tech, like technically wise? It depends on it depends on the space and how it's used. I mean, if it's if it's built into the attic, we probably and it's not the full length. It's just a bonus area above the garage. We're going to call it a single story home with a bonus room. Okay, that's how we would. That's how I would look at it. Um, in that respect, now if they did the whole upstairs that way, then I'd say no. You just it's built a second story. Okay. You, you understand what I'm saying? So if I they want to go above the garage sense. and do that bonus area on one end of the house, do it because. The way the trusses were able to go, but I would only allow it in a small, small portion, and it would all have to be up in the nor where it didn't change the character. It looks like a single story from outside. Okay. You've heard the discussion, Tate. What, what's your? How are you feeling about the? What, we're we're fine with however you guys want the trail as a city. I mean, obviously, we're we're happy to oblige with with whatever that is. I mean. If you want to put the condition that um, at um, final plat, you know, we need to have the design for all the retaining walls between lots, I mean, happy to do that as well and, and put that in. I mean, it's going to need done anyways. And if you want the uniformity, we, we also understand that on, on the ridge line. So we uh, try to be as flexible as, as possible. Yeah. Further questions for the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Murphy. Uh, council? Um, it's been a good discussion. Let's. Where are you on this? Well, I I just kind of like to take everybody's temperature. I mean, are are we feeling like we want it to be consistent all the way across, or because you know I know what the applicant said. It, it makes more sense if you've got a lot of rock in there just to build a single story. But I guarantee there will be people that will say. I'm okay spending another hundred thousand to get a walkout basement. You know, I mean, so I, I think it needs to be consistent yeah. with a padded padded lot and the walls built with the development because I don't want to leave it up to these property owners. On it's just this is the last piece. We've been very consistent. It's turning out like everyone wants. I think let's just keep it consistent along this ridge and it's single story padded lots. If there's rock walls, they need to match the basalt black rock. If they decide to landscape it, I don't think we should hold that against them. I would rather be the salt rock, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of leaning that way myself. But the lots need to be graded, mass graded, mass and graded, and, and set lots set before we final plat or anything. Right. So the, was I correct in understanding that that uh, Coral Canyon development has a height limit of 25 I, I can't, feet? That, I don't know for sure. But so I, what I would want is where I'm at is uh, like a 25 foot. Um, height max and, and slab on grade is what I, I think that that is more consistent with what I don't know from what I wanted and maybe what I heard out of the council I think I think that uh, in in what we saw with with all the uh, residents from that area that came in and spoke and, and you know this developer's been very good they've listened to us and, and appreciate the fact that they're trying to make concessions for this but I think that I think that we need to be consistent and uh, I do think that we would have some some walk out two stories and not that I'm opposed to them in, in, in some terms, but on this ridge, I think we need to be, I think it's more important that we're consistent with what we're doing up there. So it's so visible. It's so critical. We're right there on the freeway too. Yeah. Any, Any other yeah. thoughts on this one? Oh, ready to make a motion, Mayor. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna try to be slow so I get everything. Yes. <laughs> You've got at least five years 
Yeah, five, tentatively, five maybe years. maybe more than that. Uh, five years here, well, ten years, dozens of years. Listening. Call me old. <laughs> no, I'm not calling you old. I just I'm glad that somebody was making notes besides me and Councilman Ivy on this because yeah. we, we want to get this right. I'll make a motion. And then Tate, just oh. I want to make sure you're listening too. Okay, I know you are, but. I'm ready. I'll make a motion that we approve zone change Z-23-13 from open space to PUDR located approximately Highland Park and Vineyard Yard with the following conditions provided, uh, following findings and conditions provided by staff with the additional conditions. Condition number one, that the subdivision needs to be graded to be single story pad grade lots. Slab on grade lots. The next condition that if there's rock walls designed, that those rock walls along the ridge line will be black basalt rock stained to match the existing rock along the edge. And that means even the white basalt rocks need to be stained. Then the next condition is uh, if there is elevated scar with fill on the edges, that, that goes with the rock, but elevated scar without a rock wall and there's a slope, that needs to be an irrigated landscape if they choose to do that. It's either rock walls or it's irrigated slope. Then condition number four. The next condition is the max height of 25 feet for the single story homes. And the next condition is that the, do we care about the trail? I think we do. Okay, so the trail along the roadway uh, is offset five feet from the curb line. And it can be either asphalt or concrete as long as it's five feet off of the I think along the road the we curb. should probably just do concrete. You said in there, you said in there single story. Single story. Not just the 25 foot right? Yep, it's a 25 story well, single 25 story. foot height, but it's a slab on grade, grade single, single story, story homes. Okay. Story. There. I, there I think it's very clear. It's very clear. Yep. And, and I think we're going to get a second on this. Did everybody understand the, the trail? Just one clarification. Trail? What, what material? We got to offset five. I think along roadways is concrete, everywhere else is asphalt. Five okay. foot from the but okay. I, I actually don't care either way. I just want the five foot landscaping, but I'll leave that up to the county. Just leave, and we want it straight, not meandered. No. And you're just talking on the street. Not, we want it straight so that we only have 15 feet. So within the 15 feet, we want a five foot landscape strip between the curb and the 10 foot trail. So, so point of clarification, down further off, of, coming off a of telegraph, that alternates. There's some sections that are uh, asphalt in some sections that are yeah. concrete where they're going between homes. So I don't care what the material is. I don't care either. I, that. As long as it's a 10 foot trail and an offset five foot from the back of the curve. Then we, we won't, we won't dictate the material either concrete or asphalt and leave that up to the developer. Okay, oh. you, you just wanted the, the biggest thing is that five foot landscape buffer between the street and that on that. Okay. Right. Okay. Good discussion. You've heard, you've heard the motion. Do I have a second? We have a motion by Councilman Coates. Second by Councilman Belliston. Are you comfortable with this? Who did I start with last time? When I went this way? We'll, we'll go roll call. Councilman Ivey? Aye. Coates? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Belliston? Aye. Casperson? Aye. The ordinance is approved unanimously with very detailed and specific conditions to preserve that precious top of the Mesa for those who live on top of it and who see it from below. Okay, good job, council. Move on to the next item. This is 6B. This is consideration to approve an ordinance changing a portion of 4200 South Street extension to Hayfield Drive. City recorder Tara Pence will explain to the council why this needs to happen. Aaron, council. Um, I was recently contacted by the Washington County Recorder's Office Back in 2021, we did a road dedication for 4200 South Street Extension, um, which was great at the time. It continued on the road, but when they started doing the development, the road has a significant curve. 
and they went in to try to address, and the addresses would have been a south address on a south street. So they renamed the road to Hayfield Drive, which will continue on the full curve, but in order for that to be a recognized road, the county has to have an ordinance by the council approving that name change. Got it. Ready to make a motion. <laughs> okay, I'll call for a motion to, to uh, change a portion of the previously recorded 4200 South Street extension to Hayfield Drive. So made. Second. <laughs> Got a motion by Councilman Belliston. Second by Councilman Colts. We'll go roll call starting with Councilman Coates. Aye. Bellis, or excuse me, Henderson. Aye. Belliston. Aye. Casperson. Aye. Ivy. Aye. <clears throat> Tara, that was the smoothest item of the night. Thank you. Well done. We'll move along to item seven, agreements. 7A, this is consideration to approve the poll attachment license agreement. Uh, Power Director Rick Hansen presented during the work session. Um, is there any additional question or comment, or are we ready for motion on this item? I'm ready when you are, Mayor. Councilman Ivey, go ahead and make the motion. Good. We good? I make a motion to approve the poll attachment license agreement. We have a motion by Councilman Ivey. I'm looking for a second. I will second that. <laughs> Councilman Casperson seconds. Now let's go roll call with Councilman Henderson. Aye. Belliston. Casperson. Aye. Ivy. Aye. Coates. Aye. Thank you. That was even easier than the last. You, you might have just you might have just topped the recorder. <laughs> Item seven B. This is a discussion regarding modifying conditions to zone change Z-23-02. So that was the second ordinance of 2023. And terms of a development agreement for Elevate that, uh, well, we still haven't seen yet. Uh, City Planner Eldon Gibb, will you present on this? And I see the applicant on this item is here as well. This one will require some discussion, so I'm gonna have to break the streak here. <laughs> Um, on May 24, 2023, City Council approved Z-23-03, rezoning approximately 44.01 acres. This approval was contingent upon City Council approving a development agreement. During the discussion of this item, the build out and connection of Grapevine Crossing Roadway to this development was discussed, or staff concluded that three lanes of travel would be built and serve this development and surrounding areas until the adjacent properties develop and at which that time the full build out of the roadway would be complete. The applicant would like to further discuss this requirement, um, the build out of Grapevine Crossing with City Council specifically asking Council to build out Grapevine Crossing with two lanes of travel. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me at this time. What questions so, do you have for Eldon? Go ahead, Councilman Belliston. Eldon, when this, because I wasn't here, when this project came forward, did we require a traffic study from the applicant? Typically, we would require for a commercial development, this is commercial and residential and. I'm trying to remember. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember if we saw one. Was it was a zone change? Was a zone change? We may not if there might have been a condition put on it, but because it was a zone change, generally we do that at subdivision time. It's one of the things they have to come up with one. Um, but but again, have it's to a zone change to a P PUD that pretty much gives the entitlement that if we're giving the entitlement to the commercial uses and the, res the large residential uses there, we should have a traffic study with it. The reason why I bring this up is because I've paid for a traffic study up there. And I know that the original Sienna Hills traffic study that was done for the PCD in that area did not include any provisions for any of this property. And it didn't have a provision for a roadway coming off the top of the hill, adding into the traffic on a grapevine crossing. So we kind of got a twofer there where the original traffic study for the entire area didn't include any of this, uh, any of the use. Um, I'm, we'll, we'll ask the applicant to come forward and address that in a minute. He's, he's given me the nod that there is a traffic study. I'll let him explain in further detail, Councilman. Okay. 
further discussion among, on this item or further questions for city planner? I just want to state for the record, uh, it was approved. It was approved on condition of this development agreement and we've been waiting 11 months for it. So just so the council is aware. Thank you, Eldon. Thank you. Council, uh, are you ready for the applicant? Mr. Tate Murphy? L Ele <coughs> just go ahead and say your name for the record. Yeah, Tate Murphy with Elevate Development. So um, there was a little misunderstanding and, and it was on our part when we were doing it. So we still want to do three lanes beside where there will be turning in and out on Grapevine Crossing adjacent to our development, because at that point we will need a turn lane for people in and out. Our thought was when we exit our property and it's the connection that we wanted to serve so people could use the freeway, there was no need for a middle turn lane in the fact that the purpose of that was just to connect and allow people out without going through the neighborhood. So the clarification here is three lanes for everywhere that there is an access to turn into. And then when we exit that, which is at our property line, a two lane road just to facilitate traffic going to the freeway. Um, we did do a traffic study for this that was submitted, um, but all we're asking for is to only build two lanes, not three from the property line to the existing grapevine crossing that comes off the roundabout since there's no need for a turn lane for purposes of what this is serving. And when you talk to your property line, you're talking over here, right? Right. So yeah, right over the commercial side as well, you would build the three lanes out. <clears throat> so you see where right there where it hits Sitla's property, right where your mouse is. Yeah. So I mean, as we're exiting the property, there's no need for a turn lane anymore because there's nowhere to turn into. Right. And that's just an access road. So the clarification here before I think Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the last thing that we need to bring a, a polished development agreement, um, or sorry, that, um, if you bring a, a polished development agreement, but it's just that section right there of two lane road that we said was three, I think because we were talking about the three lane up top, but we just needed some clarification on that front. Can you send a copy of that traffic report? Mm -hmm, of course. And, and I'll, I'll think, bring it to the top I of I think the, what you'll find is with the, <clears throat> at least from what I have, in what I've reviewed and what I've in the discussions I've had with uh, Aaron over at Corox that um, I mean he, he's saying it needs to be five all the way to the corner of your property and, it may actually need and it, to be five yeah and the property. traffic study does say that once we're at full build out the purpose of this road <clears throat> was just to allow the residential portion of ours to exit the property right and so eventually once all of that sitlow land and, and your land that you have the option on is is built out yeah absolutely there will be need, need to be a five lane road there there will be places to turn into there will be a commercial development on on that sitlow ground right now the traffic study does facilitate all of that this is just for the access road to span the gap between what we don't own and what we do own so that the traffic isn't going through the neighborhood and that's why it, the discussion is the two lanes versus the three and if there's nowhere to turn into, we think it makes sense to only have two lanes since there's nowhere to turn into anyways. And that when that's built out, whoever's responsible for it builds obviously the turn lane. So Mayor, has Public Works weighed in on this, our engineer or Public Works at all to just verify that this, I'm just wondering if that was the sole reason for that third lane there. I mean, it, it makes sense what you're saying, but. We were just negotiating, I mean, I think Eldon probably watched it again. It was some negotiation on the fly back then and we were like, let's just do three lanes. And no, as we looked. it wasn't on the fly. Like, I understand yeah. we were negotiating, but we were pretty clear. I was. I was pretty clear. So Are I you guess sure why, that's why, what we're agreeing to? Why the three lanes from the corner to Because you have, line? how many units do you have? Well, because the three lanes doesn't make any more traffic, right? Oh, that's just a turn I'm, lane. I'm just asking you, yeah. man, how many units do you, are you proposing plus commercial? And I can't control what happens on the other properties. So the concern I had is that we need the three lanes to service your property yeah. that's where i'm at yeah, i guess i'm just c c confused on how a turn lane on that section would serve our property there's nowhere to to turn i just into. want an adequately sized road yeah. so if, if it's going to end up being five lanes in the end you would typically build the three in the middle and then then the when it develops the others would develop with the yep. sidewalk curb gutter trail on their portion i mean i understand what you're saying is how he's asking how that's his responsibility but 
but if you only build two, who gets the other two and somebody gets a one and it just ends up being the same argument just down the road. Yeah, right? We're just going to build that middle cross section of road. And so that it's, you know, when they come in, it's just easy to expand it, right? I understand. Yeah. So did I hear right that there was a concern with some of the drainage as well? The culverts and whatnot that would be... That that, be that, yeah, that's all part of it that there's within the development agreement. It contemplates that wash being relocated to where everyone thinks it's or where it's supposed to be, right? Which is on the site plan between the two residential sections. That wash will be relocated to there, which is what everything downstream already thinks it is, right? So I'm just trying to kind of wrap my head around it because what you're saying makes sense. But I'm also thinking of development down that road in the future, kind of what Jeremy, uh, city manager Jeremy was alluding to. And so in the future, that's going to be kind of, you know, it's not all going to develop at once. It's going to be piecemeal street development. And so if you've got just two lanes running down the middle, and a developer is responsible for finishing part of the road. They'll be responsible. Then there's they a own problem. both sides of the road, so the developer yeah. will be responsible for. Both but then sides. there's no turn lane in that. You know what I'm saying? So it, I can totally understand what you're saying, but it creates a problem down the road for development up and down that road. It'll, it'll end up looking a lot like the Fields Road, where we built two lanes in the middle, and then somebody will build on this side. And then we shift everything over for a while, and then and then it and goes wide, to, narrow, wide, narrow. It'll, and we need well, to maintain. Jeremy, a correct me if I'm wrong, but because it's the same ownership, when they build on the one side, wouldn't they have to finish both well, sides of the road? Sitla often transfers that ownership to somebody okay. else, and that development uh, obligation as well. So they're going to finish from there the asphalt that you would put to the back of the curb and gutter where the property line is. That's their responsibility. I would just assume because that portion's for the most part undevelopable right in there. That the city would probably no, it's not undevelopable. They just haven't graded it yet. That's on that little triangle. It's just it's developable. Okay. They just decided not to grade it yet. That's all. You know, it's tough. It's tough when you're out in the middle of you know you're off in the beaten path. Those are offsite costs that are. I mean, I, I'd recommend go trying to work out a deal with Sitla and help have them help contribute to your cost as well. Um, I, I get concerned cutting it down to two lanes because we have, you know, emergency vehicles we have to get in there in case there's two lanes of traffic. How do you get your emergency vehicle in there if we need to? With that many residents, there's just lots of reasons why we require the that many lanes to get up into that. I mean, it's because of the density. We, we proved you that density. I, I just think we need to stick to what we agreed to on this. So what I'm kind of seeing is as development you know, if you built two lanes, those are two traffic lanes right next to each other. As development happens along there, as they finish their portion to the road, there's no workable or usable turning lane because the traffic lanes are both in the middle. You know what I'm saying? And so I like the, who mentioned approaching Sitla and seeing if they could put some in. Um, we, we, we tried that approach. Okay. Didn't, yeah, when, when as you would suspect. So. And I understand where you're at. I just, I do feel for you when it comes to it because it's hard to build a piece out away and you have a long stretch, but I don't feel comfortable with this much density without getting the appropriate access to it. And we can't send everybody back through Sienna Hills. I think we've maxed those out. I guess my question is on any other two lane road in the city, don't you have the same problem with emergency vehicles? We I don't, mean, on we all don't. those roads that are coming out right now? They're not two lane roads. I guess like coming off, yeah. A okay. minimum city street is that, what, 35 feet of asphalt. So I guess. We're not saying you have to curb and gutter it. Yeah. Cause so that's, 35 feet of asphalt is kind of what we're. Isn't that the minimum subdivision road? I can't remember right off. Oh, John's that's, saying yes. That's the minimum subdivision. When, when you made the condition, we didn't, we didn't add a, an asphalt. We didn't. We three, but three, three lanes, lanes is. Yeah. I mean, twelve and twelve is twenty-four plus. You know, I mean, thirty-six, but thirty-five is the minimum. Usually, eleven-foot middle lane, so that's three lanes. That's a that's a standard residential road. I mean, if that's where you guys stand, then 
I mean, I think we're probably ready to bring the development agreement back in the next city council meeting for kind of final blessing. Thad, will you just add to, to Mr. Murphy's point and just give us an update on that development agreement from the city standpoint? Yeah, the development agreement has been completed for probably several months now. Um, the question that's remained is this one that you're discussing tonight. And so if, if the applicant feels like there's a consensus with the council, um, I think it, it could be ready as early as next meeting, yes. So, so what happens if it doesn't? Because it's already been 11 months. I mean, I'm in the frame of mind. Because it was a condition. That's why I didn't want to move forward until we had it, because I wanted to be clear. Of course, we're back here 11 months later. In my mind, if it's not done in the next two months, then it's done because it's over a year. So the, the motion on zoning was contingent on a development agreement returning to council for approval. And so um, I've been, I've tried to be clear with the applicants that there is no vested zoning yet because the, the uh, conditions upon that zoning decision have not been satisfied. Um, I would agree that at some point, if that condition isn't met, the city would need to take a position as to expiry of that of that uh, that decision. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay, thank you. That's so, so. What I'm hearing from our city attorney, uh, it sounds consistent with what I'm hearing from you. That the the, the last remaining item in order for a satisfactory development agreement to come back to the council is the the width of of Grapevine Crossing. Yeah, so I mean, if, if 35 feet or three lanes, I mean, however you guys want to state it, is, is the decision, then I think we're ready to bring that back to the next council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. So uh, I think what I got from this was clarity on what was already part of the original approval. Thad, what action do you recommend we take on this Considering that, is there no action necessary or? Yeah, I don't suggest the council take an action. Um, this is the guidance that Mr. Murphy and I needed to uh, finalize the draft. So we're, we're clear. Um, and it was just a discussion, not an action item. Great, any further comments on this? Everybody feel okay about it? Great. All right, uh, let's move on to item eight. Report of officers from assigned committees, and I'm going to start with Councilman Belliston. <laughs> I'll make a motion to end the meeting. <laughs> did, you got, guys, did you guys? I mean, hear he's my not motion? technically a rookie, but you know, he's back on. So go ahead, Councilman. You guys missed my motion. I made a motion to end the meeting. Oh, you did. <laughs> Bill, for lack of second, we could do this under Wait, an hour if we're all quick. It. Uh, just real quick, uh, you, you guys are probably aware that <clears throat> the CEC channel is going to be disbanded here uh, soon, but it won't be disbanded, disbanded until next summer. Um, there will be some rebate to the cities of funds, um, uh, you know, that are current operating costs that, are, that they have, uh, current uh, reserves that they have, and then they've got a couple of vehicles and they'll sell off for surplus and then distribute those funds back. And that'll be, <clears throat> the discussion was based on uh, population or percentage of contrib contribution or something like that. We'll figure out how the board puts it. Um, <clears throat> there is some discussion to keep Melissa that's been doing yeah, that. Melissa to, Anderson. Right, to try and find a way for her to work. The thought was we, that she would stay with the county and do regional type news stories, but that was met with pretty uh, cold mm. <laughs> or, or, or lukewarm excitement. I'm, right. I'm a little behind. What's the CEC? Is the it? Community Education Channel. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, that they do a lot of the regional reports on transportation or you know things like that that are going on. What so, councilman? So I actually was at lunch with Coach Judkins today, and he, and he had kind of I hadn't really heard. I knew that there. I mean, obviously, with the with the TDS contribution shrinking with cable, um, what's the future of it? I mean, from from his standpoint, they they you know, they broadcast a lot of those ball games at the university. They even broadcast some of the high school games. I know they help with the county and our neighbors in St. George with their council meetings. Is there a, 
is there a future for that for that need well, he was he was concerned with it and i just didn't really know how to answer i, I think there's a desire to kind of keep it going but um it but where's be, the funding <laughs> yeah it would be up to the cities to could create an interlocal to say hey we'd like to keep her on to you know keep doing this but um you know in in the absence of the county stepping up and saying hey we'd like to keep her on at a county level um then it kind of goes away and a lot now of the resources at the university were involved they were the university would probably retain the 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 channel i guess but it would not it, yeah. but it would be the university owned right so anyway that's coming up july of 2025 uh mm -hmm. it will be done um I, I think the challenge with keeping a doing an interlocal for a reporter for you know kind of regional type of stuff is that the cities all have their own marketing kind of arms for city related projects and so um you know that's just a thought moving down the road but i'll let you know more as it gets discussed i think it's going to be discussed next quarter in the end of may we're going to have uh try to see you know where the where the feedback is so think about it let me know if mm -hmm. there's any desire to to be involved with an interlocal with for regional stuff and that's it thank you councilman bellison councilman henderson yes thanks mayor uh, so thad and i had a meeting with the shade tree committee today and it's always good and it's a busy time for them because spring is in fact i talked to one of the guys on the way out of the meeting and he said you know he was super busy because they start turning on their sprinklers and stuff now in the spring and that's when they discover their sprinkler line breaks and things like that but uh one thing we learned today is that thad correct me if i'm wrong we've had 11 years now in the uh, Tree City USA. That's correct. And two, this is our second year for a certain award, and I can't remember the name of it. The Growth Award. Growth Award. Tell us about that. Do you remember? Yes, I did ask the question at the hearing as to what, what exactly was the Growth Award. The Growth Award is awarded by Tree City USA when one of their city members submits sufficient uh, data and details to show that their 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 compliance with the tree city metrics has actually increased year over year and so the growth ward indicates generally things like from last year to this year we've increased the amount of areas or spaces that contain shade trees we've planted more shade trees um, or taken other measures to manage shade trees in a way that we hadn't yet and so it's a sign that the shade tree committee is active and the parks department administering the the purpose of the shade tree committee is active and accomplishing those results in our city and only 15 percent of the shade tree cities receive that extra award so yeah it's not an award that gets handed out to everybody uh, you you do have to show year over year improvement in those metrics all i have mayor thank you well and i see paul walker back there like a proud pop overseeing all those trees and of course we all know that it's Anita Millet near the front row who makes them actually grow. <laughs> no, we appreciate you both. We, we do have wonderful trees. Thanks. I don't even know if it's city council tonight, so I don't even know why my name is out there because I just came just to enjoy what's going to find out what's going on in the city. I was just giving you a compliment on all the great work you do to make our our open space and our trees and grounds beautiful. You do a great job, Mrs. Much. Millette. It's an absolute team effort. We're proud of them too. Councilman Coates. I don't have anything to report tonight, Mayor. The, my meetings will be before the next one. Wonderful. Councilman Knighton. You know, I've never been prone to brag. <laughs> really? <laughs> but we represented <laughs> we represented uh, Washington City very well in the cornhole tournament. Yeah. That was a great event between the St. George Area Chamber, the Washington Area Chamber, the Hurricane Valley Chamber, and it was a very well attended. It was well done. Um, Ed Tracy emceed it, and it was it was a lot of fun. Great vendors there, and it was a great event. We really enjoyed participating in that. <clears throat> and the last thing that I'd mention is that um, today at the St. George Area of Chamber of Commerce, 
they had their Element Award. This is where they honor three women in the community that are excelling in their element within, within business, <clears throat> within our community. And one of our own was awarded one of those three awards. Madonna from the Duff Center, a lot of you know her. She was awarded today and she served at, or worked at the Duff Center for 20 years. And it was very, a very nice program and uh, just very proud of her and the Dove Center and the other re recipients as well, Mayor. Now back to that cornhole. <laughs> yes, sir. Did we lose any matches? No. I think so. All right. <laughs> Who was it that was on the team? That would be uh, Mr. Hess and I. Nice. Do you want to come give a speech, Jordan? <laughs> Only if we have the bags. Who, who won? The, like, who won level. overall? <laughs> Were you there? Oh. Who won? Like, well, was there like an overall winner or were we there? So, so we won, although we, we didn't know that, that we had to have certain people there to get the award. We actually won, but the, war, uh, the trophy went home with Hurricane for some reason. We're trying to figure that out. Councilman, if you can address that for us. So what you're telling me is you think you won. At, and you're just proclaiming you won, but you really didn't win. <laughs> we're, we're, hey, we have an appeal. Drew, just bring that trophy back over to Washington, okay? And I'll show up next time so we can get the award. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Casperson. And neither do I. Uh, City Manager Report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just give you some update on the budget, because I know nobody wants to leave tonight without hearing about our our budget. Brian and I have been working diligently on it, mostly Brian and a little bit me, but we should have a draft budget to you. We're hoping by around the 6th of April, so it's coming around the corner pretty soon. We would like to have a Saturday work meeting. I know that doesn't sound super fun to everybody, but we can just focus on the budget. Um, we'd like to do that on April 13th. If you can check your schedules and let me know if you're interested in some one-on-one -on -one time, um, certainly let me know and I'm I'm willing to meet with you otherwise, but I think it's beneficial this year for us all to get together and go over some some budget and, information. And Jeremy, as a group. didn't you say when we were discussing the budget earlier that you'd be able to get kind of a draft out to the council a week before that? Yep, yep. hoping about April sixth to have you a draft that you can you can review and come with some questions. And the idea would be we meet in the boardroom at ten o'clock and go for a few hours for a couple of hours, Mayor. Is that what you're thinking? Well, whatever it takes. But I'm thinking, I would think a couple of hours is plenty, but we can go longer if you want to go longer. Brian and I love to talk budget, so we can keep going. 6 a.m. Uh, you know, whatever time works for you. <laughs> I'm not going to get between I them. prefer five. I'm fine with five. 10 a.m. is I'll zoom in. Council Henderson's lunch, so <laughs> we need or to get up early. <laughs> Jeremy, would there be any special treats or food or <laughs> we've got tell me what are we talking here on a saturday what are we talking I'll just come clean with them jeremy it's okay i, I can bring some treats uh, all right early treats no, not lunch treats i'm talking breakfast type treats get it get you in early but um after we have that the tentative budget will be april 24th then we'll have our public hearing may 8th and if all goes well adopt the budget on may 22nd which is about a month early We've done that the last three years, get it out of the way, move on to, to other more exciting things. And I would I would mention that I've been here three and a half years and I have never been invited to a shade tree committee meeting. So <laughs> I would love to attend one sometime if I if I rise to the level of being invited. So manager, may I uh, co op some of your time to make an announcement? Okay. So so moved. Thank you. <laughs> Um, one of the items discussed in the Shade Tree Committee meeting today was a desire to add a few more members of our citizens to the committee. And so just announced to the mayor and council if, if there's someone that you think would make a good citizen member of our Shade Tree Committee, I'll let Paul Walker know. I, I just want to clarify, I do not want to be on the committee, but I would love to come once. So please let me know when it happens. Thanks. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, thank you for your work on the budget. We look forward, we'll, we'll plan on that meeting. Tara, if you'll send that out to the council and get that on our calendar for April 13th at 10 a.m. 
and we do not have need to go to a closed session. So now, Councilman Casper, would be a wonderful time to make that motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Councilman Casperson. Second. Second by uh, committee. All in favor? Aye. We stand adjourned. <laughs>